Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. Noah Starna Cav announcement officially. Maybe it's just a rumor. Who knows? So we soldier on. But as always, this show is brought to you by Zwift. The Zwift Hub is available. The best priced trainer on the market, according to DC Rainmaker, who probably the most authoritative reviewer uh, of these sort of tech products, he said it's a product that that's well above every other trainer in that price ballpark, which is under $500 US. And it is available in the UK, the US, and Europe. So if you want to get on top of your New Year's resolutions, there's no better time than now. Check out the Zwift Hub. If you haven't got a trainer, that will allow you to hop on Zwift, hop on, hop in a lot easier. And you can, yeah, choose which cassette. It's easier to set up. There's YouTube videos attached. It's never been easier to train indoors on Zwift with the Zwift Hub. On to now a team that should be quite worried about relegation at the end of the next triennium cycle, Team DSM, who, along with Astana, were one of the bottom two teams in World Tour this year, despite Bardet being in quite good shape. They won 10 races, and they did focus a lot on World Tour level races. Uh, Five of them were at World Tour level, including a Giro and a Vuelta stage, and the rest were at Dot Pro. So they weren't farming uh, 1.1s, etc. And Bardet was looking really good at the Giro before he had to abandon and admirably backed up at the Tour de France with a sixth, which I think is quite good for you know, having to yep. abandon the Giro six to seven weeks before. But it still wasn't good, Benji. Um, it's still it's still a far cry from DSM 2018. Yeah, for certain. And even 2020 when it comes to Hershey, like yep. those results and so forth. If we look at last year, for example, was very similar to this year. I'd say they basically stagnated compared to last year because last year they did have more stage wins at the Vuelta. They didn't have that Giro stage win. But instead, they now have a sixth at the Tour de France and would have potentially fought for a podium at the Giro if Bardet didn't get six. So I'd argue that maybe it's a 1-2% better than last year, their World Tour performances. And when we look at like the classic sense of all, they didn't perform last year in those. and this year, it was quite troublesome again to do so. It's it's logical when you look at this team that they're not going to be winning the, the cobble races in the year. But they made it a bit harder for them as well with the way they acted with um, with Søren Kroh Andersen, for example. Because I swear he was first supposed to skip the cobble races. After having a great Milano San Remo, by the way, strongest attacker on the Poggio was Søren Kroh Andersen. Pogacar did it 10 times, but Søren Kralnesson's move on the steep section was the one that really put people in trouble. Now, back to what I was saying, they had Søren Kralnesson skip the couple races to do the hill classics, but then last minute they said, oh, you can still ride RVV, which is good because he was supposed to ride RVV based on the fact that he was strong at MSR. And then he last minute got ill just before RVV, so that's, of course, a bummer. But then he ended up doing the hill classics, and I swear he didn't do anything in the hill classics if my if my mind remembers the results correctly. So that was off the table. 50th and able him, though. Was he attacking from the peloton behind the group Laporte Binyam? Like last I minute? I think so. <laughs> uh, he must quite have, a, yeah. Quite a notable way to get 50th and able him, to be honest. Well, it's like his clever. second at San Remo the year before. Oh, no, he didn't come it, second. Oh, it's clever God. because the domestiques of the likes of Alpacin were completely done for. Merlier was not riding yeah. for Phillips and Phillips and not for Merlier. So... All the domestics of all the sprinting teams were kind of done, so it was a very clever move to attack then to secure that fifth position, and you can get as close as you want uh, from that point on, depending on how slow the front group goes, of course. But next to that, you've got some results in the smaller cobble slash Belgian races because this race doesn't really have many cobbles. Wellsford and Van Uden getting third in Thorf and Scheldepreis, which was a really hard Scheldepreis when it comes to the weather and so Thorf, the one Christoph won. When it comes to the likes of a, a Wellsford and a Van Uden, Van Uden is a, a guy that was riding at a, as a stagiaire for the team, or did he, he was on the sign halfway team, through the year? And then they brought him up. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's kind of a versatile, sprinty type, right? Yeah, just like a classics prospect. Really nice rider. Um, they got a lot of. That's the thing. They got a lot of really nice sort of prospects, but they don't have. They have one GC rider and what's Rome Bardet tenth best GC rider in the world? Like yeah. that sort of region. Um as of now, they don't really have a premier, they don't have a top ten sprinter in the world. A Wilson's, you know, a nice rider, but he's not a top ten sprinter in the world. They don't have a top 15 or 20 classics rider in the world to put it nicely in the Ardennes Bardet's their best so it's just like like we said for Intermarche you can be strong in some weak in others you don't need to have a top 10 rider yeah. in each category but they don't really have any in anything the thing is we need to go back to the concept of DC DSM for a second we know that DSM is a team that has a lot of youngsters right now they've had a lot of youngsters in the past and they started signing now the older riders like a Dagen Kolb and a Bardet to try and get results there as well. But we noticed that the youngsters join the team through their development team. And by the time they reach their potential, they are leaving the team. It happened to Hirschi and so forth, to plenty of others in the team. And I fear that it's going to be the same for most of the youngsters in this team. The second they reach their potential is when they part ways with the team because they feel like they don't have as many opportunities anymore. And that's why. DSM is often seen as the development team with a development team because they have development riders coming from their development team to their team to basically when the second that they reach their potential go to other teams. So that is their main issue, I think, when it comes to reaching their potential as a team as well because if all your good riders, the second they become good, leave your team, then you're never going to be very competitive at the highest level, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting that like we're always, you know, some of the teams are not very scientific or not as scientific as you might expect. And then you've got DSM at the other end of the spectrum who seem to like, they have sports scientists, they have people doing measurements, they have, you know, trying to do things in a scientific way. But it's like they got it out of some sort of like rigid textbook without understanding like, I understand the saddle high issue. I still don't know whether that happened or not or it didn't happen. Let's say it happened. The saddle, no, you're not allowed to move your saddle height without consulting eight different people. Like, they said you couldn't change your saddle height because a team of specialists set the saddle height earlier in the year in the off season. Okay, I understand that. But you're not taking into account so many different things like the rider psychologically. If a rider, like, right, the, the mental game is like 80% of it. If they're thinking there's something wrong and you don't let them fix it, that's not a yeah. good situation. Second of all, people's bodies change. Hey, symmetries change. How do you not know that his body, which is incredibly an incredibly important feedback mechanism, is telling you that those measurements no longer work because something in my body's changed or I have a muscular balance that's changed. So things like that, they kind of, and because you read all the, on Vila Flitz did a long interview with them, not recently, throughout the year about, you know, putting this question to them, Benji, like, yeah. how can you have a team where all the good young riders leave? And frankly, a lot of the answers were kind of unsatisfactory or lacked a fair bit of self-perspective which is that you know the riders are human and and it's not just the preparation stuff like that it's also like i look at they could get more wins out of these guys i feel like they don't even target like they'll send brenner and give him like an unrealistic goal or something like he's still yeah. a pretty good rider like i still think there's also some more realistic races or breakaways they could be sent to like Aronsman and the Vuelta. Do you feel like this team also hasn't handled the development of some riders, as well as, for example, a Bora? Because with Kian Uitebroeks, we saw him gradually improve him across the year now already in one year, while Marco Brenner took so much longer to get to the level that he currently is at, because he also was sent to, to races where he got really weird moments that he had to do stuff on. Because 
I swear, Dauphiné 2021, not sure if it was 2021, where we saw Brenner just attacking on the most random moments where we know that if the attack happens there, it's going to be completely useless. And we saw that with Sören Kronos and quite a bit of well uh, throughout the last two years. So is there a factor where, I don't know, the team car just at random moments decide, oh, you can go, while well, it's a really stupid moment to attack. But in the development cycle, I feel like Bora is just doing much better than DSM. Their riders are actually making significant steps forward. Like Henry van der Nabela, I'm not that satisfied with his growth in 2021 and 2022. Like, am I asking this too early? I think, um, well, yes, on Brenner. So Brenner, like, did 66 race days, which is quite a lot. Like, on Yumbo, most of them didn't do over 65, and that's experienced guys for the most part. Uh, And majority of his were at World Tour level in serious races too, not just, like, Mickey Mouse races. Uh, And on Mm -hmm. to your Vendetta Beal point, I would say, I don't know if, again, you know, these guys might have had injuries or something. Yeah. I don't know, but they, they're also picking up a lot of young guys who aren't Brenner the exception. They're not Keanu Atterbrooks. They're not Juan Ayuso. So yeah. should they be in a world tour team at 20 years old? If you're not really, really, really good, like... I'm not sure you should be. Um, and then kind of, they lost like Leo Hayter. Yeah, exactly. Because they were some, yeah. Leo Hay, wasn't Leo Hayter the guy that was angry at them for not sending him to the World Tour team yet last year? I don't know what happened. I, mean, I think there was a always... drama somewhere with a rider at DSM where the World Tour, I think DSM didn't want to step that rider up to their World Tour team I yet and the right. rider disagreed with it. I think it was Leo Hayter, but I'm not sure. They had to give the spot to um to Tim Narberman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, it's you can give ten, twenty year old second year U twenty threes all seventy K a year, ten of them. Or you can give Juan Ayuso five hundred K for the, on a four year deal. Neo Pro 500k. It sounds no one will give what I use so 500k except maybe matching or maybe it wasn't even 500. I don't know. His extension now to you're not getting paid 500k in 2028. I tell you that, but um, <laughs> you know, the, the top, top, top talent is what wins race the biggest races overwhelmingly. Um, and I'm not sure there's an aggregate effect of getting 10 because, like. I'm a roundabout way of saying I like a scattergun approach in a dev team where you get 12 to 15 nice riders and then two or yeah. three become really legit guys. Bang, up to World Tour. That's a dev team. That's what FDJ do. Gregoire and um, Lenny and Plowright. No, he's gone to Alveson. But anyway, you get my and point. And Paleni? Does that ruin your point? <laughs> Who's that? That's also a guy that was sent to the group. <laughs> 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 yeah that anyway majority are good <laughs> no i'm sure he's quite good um i just i don't follow you 23 that closely but yeah it's just it's odd and i don't know if budgets can an issue like is budget a real problem um are they or is it not and they're overpaying Dagen Cobb and Bardet i don't know because like Evan let's talk about their transfers SKA out Nikias aren't good rider out case bowl um, out apparently going to be a lead out at Astana for Cav Aronsman, one of their best riders out to Ineos Dens one or two of the Swiss stage out to Bora Casper Pedersen to be a lead out at Quickstep as Bjorn Cranison retired Nordenhaus is doing cyclocross and Donovan has gone to the uh, Q3 6.5 Italian dog rider team so yeah they're there's some pretty good riders out there. Best classics rider and their best GC prospect, but it's their best GC rider, their best GC prospect, Aaronsman's gone. Bevan, quite a like had a nice season, Benji, but he's over 30. Van Herker, 25. He ain't winning Paranese anytime soon. Edmondson from Bike Exchange, 
Only brought up from the dev team. Dinham's a good rider from Bridge Lane. Poole, Flynn, Anderson and Malese, they're all young guys from the dev team. But are you surprised like they brought in like Van Hoker and Edmondson? Where do they move the needle? Harman Van Hoek is not going to move the needle at DSM, in my opinion. Alex Edmondson also. Like, I swear Edmondson had like that one decent year, was it 2017 or something, where he was really performing decently. But ever since then, I haven't really heard about Edmondson at all. I forgot he existed. And if that's the case, then he's probably not performing very well. It's really the youngsters that intrigue me here. Like the Oscar Ronley, the guy who was fighting Vingega at Crow Race, for example. Bevins, solid. As long as it's a one-year deal, which it isn't. He'd say three-year deal. And I'm not certain about that then, if it's a three-year deal when it comes to Bevan. So that's a danger for me. If it was a one-year deal or a three-year deal, I might be like, okay, it's still okay. But he's going to be 34 by then. He's going to retire at this team, basically. So I guess that's the thing. But we're talking about the riders that left as well, eh? And if we take a look at those riders that left that you just spoke about, Adensman, they probably financially couldn't compete with to be able to keep him. But on the other end, they also kind of ruined the relationship with him a bit as well. It wasn't Adensman the guy that they had in breakaways a few times and then they pulled him back from breakaways and ended up winning the stage in Grand Tours a few times. And then the one time he doesn't get pulled back, he almost wins a Giro stage and wins a Vuelta stage. So it's like they probably could have done better in that sense with Arden's one in those races could have kept that relationship up a better a better bull leaving is not the end of the world that's like okay he gets like one world tour stage win in like every two years then Søren Kroh Andersen is uh is a bummer it's good that Osmer and Kroh Andersen is retiring and not staying at the team because he's not worth of a world tour spot Søren Kroh Andersen was the only reason that he existed at this team even though when they signed, Osbjorn was technically better than Søren. So I guess over time it became only because Søren Kronlesen was there that Osbjorn stayed. Donovan Nieuwenhuis, I'm not worried about. I think Nieuwenhuis is moving towards that that cyclocross team because he wants to focus on that a bit more. The Balwaza Trek Lions team. Donovan, I'm not seeing that as a, a big mistake. Arndt leaving is also not the end of the world. Dens neither. Although Dens did win that Swiss stage, if I recall correctly. so. He can't compete for World Tour stages still. I think it's once again just like the riders that reached their potential, like an Adensman, is now leaving. And we've now gone back to riders that are in position one at their starting spot, like an Oscar Only and so forth, that are signed until 2027, though. So that's a good contract. And that kind of prevents the situation. Unless he leaves before the contract ends, which has happened already at DSM. That's a good contract, I think, right? I think they got to stop doing that. Like, what? Letting riders leave. <laughs> yeah. Like it, at what point, when you've set that precedent, does it just create more problems for you? The second, listen, you can have a five year contract. With a high performance athlete, high pressure environment, there's going to be stressful moments. There's going to be disagreements. You know, could they could teams manage them better? Maybe sure. Like, but if you create that out, especially for a talented rider, where all the other teams are sniffing around, they're like, hey, oh, they can't actually, they can't do that actually. While well, they're under contract, they have to be allowed to leave first. But if the rider thinks, fuck it. Um, I want to leave because I know they'll say they'll just say yes. Um, does that not create a worse cycle rather than a culture of we have to work this through, we honor the contract? Like, of course, you don't want to have like a toxic environment as well. I just I think it's gone too far with the breaking the contracts. Like, at the end of the day, there's no point signing Oscar only to 2027 when it's not worth the paper it's written on. If when if you're just going to let him leave when he's in his peak, when he's 23, like, yeah. so maybe they need to change something about that. Um, but you're right. Like Dinham's 22, three year deal till 25. He's a GC prospect, Australian. Um, he's quite a good rider. So I'd like to see how he yeah, goes. Pool, pool's very good too. Has Dinham gotten significantly better between 2021 and 2022? Because he got 12 to half an year in 2021. 
11th in 2022. Now he's kind of good enough to become 10th at Avenir, or do you think he can actually make that step up now? Because that's what he needs to do on getting to World Tour, eh? I feel like signing Dinam is the kind of rider that you want to have one more year at your dev team before you sign him. Yeah, he probably could could do with that. And race, let's see, he's not he's just raced two twos. He's not raced any any pro races from what I can see. Not this year. So you're right. Could he benefit from doing two ones, one ones, maybe even some dot pros with the um he could do Giro de Cecilia. Like, is that a more natural progression than if he's banged straight into being like a Chris Hamilton role or something like that? Uh, is that is that best for his development as a GC prospect? Uh, I don't know. Um, but what does this team look like, Benji, in the classics? Denkolb, Niels Ekhoff, um, Kasper Van Uden. He's actually quite yeah. nice. And um, then we're already doubting it. Now we're already figuring out, ooh, this is quite difficult to form a full team in these races. And... That's, I think, the problem with this team is that we've got that in multiple areas because if we go towards the Hill Classics as well, we're talking who's going to those races. And there's also a few options. Bardet, Leknesund, a Wiedeberg, for example. Uh, we see the options of a Brenner going to those races, perhaps. And then we're once again thinking, okay. By the way, Sean Flynn should probably go to the couple races as well. He's like a first all sprinty type. But I think he might lean more towards the the ones with a tiny bit of cobbles as well in uh, the coming years. For Marka, I'm going to keep on reminding, he won in 2019 the U23 LBL. <laughs> but he hasn't really shown that that much since, although he wasn't terrible this year, but just domestique decent. Not, I can actually do something significant decent. So... Once again, Hill Classics would also work out for him. He rode them this year. DNF, two of them, got 87 of an LBL. So most likely because he was a domestique in that race is what I would say. Then we're already thinking, who else can go? We're already looking at the youngsters. Is a Henry van der Nabela going to ride the likes of Fledge like he did this year, for example? What do we think about a Hamilton doing Hill Classics? Is Hamilton going to go to oh, the Jesus. Giro instead? Can't wait, so, scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Yeah, of course, we're clearly scraping the bottom of the barrel. And we're also going to do the same for, for the Grand Tours, let's be honest about it, because then we go towards the actual stage races, the Giro, for example. Dainese for the sprints. That's it. Are they going to the Tour in the Vuelta for me? Yeah, has to. They don't have an Ardens one. So, Marco Brenner to the Giro? Uh, I don't know what to do with Wilson. Should you use him as a super lead out for Dainese? I reckon not a bad role for him. Um, Vuelta? Yeah, well, Wilson would go for his own chances in the Vuelta. Um, I would just do some classics. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Like Van Den Abila and some other yeah. guys for the Giro. Why not send Matthew Dinham and Brenner? May the strongest survive. Send. I want you to send Dinham, Brenner, Only, Pool, um. <laughs> That Fred, the child that's in high school that's on the UAE team. Can we get some 14 year olds doing the Giro? I reckon they get through it. Um, that <laughs> Ukrainian kid did like 80 race days on that drone. Love it. Um, well, I might. Yeah. So, yeah. And then Tour de France will be Hamilton supporting Bardet. They will be going for a podium. It's very hard. That's what the target will be. Um, Even if top five. It's the park, it's the parkour. Yeah, top five is realistic because the parkour is really good for Bardet. Yeah. He was really good this year um, with some bad luck. So it's an it's a nice parkour for him. Maybe Devin Cobb there is, I don't know, Ruler or something. Bevan there is Ruler. Does Bevan do the Giro as a versatile sprinter, Benji? Like can win from a reduced group in a break? I think... And lead out Dainese. I think that works too, because he can't really do classics, so send to the Giro. Yeah, quite true. And he's also relatively decent at time trials, although the last few years I don't recall seeing that anymore. I swear that he had like a Velta time, Velta time trial back in his CCC days. That was strong on rolling hills. But yeah, we're once again starting to uh, scrape the bottom of the barrel. And as a case for the majority of the disciplines for this team. So I think the most important goals are simple, though. They want 
Bardet to try and top five, if not podium, the Tour de France. Similar stuff at the Vuelta. They're going to try and go for stage wins at the Giro and in other Grand Tours as well because Bardet doesn't necessarily deserve an entire team around him, I would dare to say. In the Classics, hoping that someone moves forward and hoping that every youngster makes a tiny bit of a step forward so that they're a stronger team next year. And I think Brenner is the one that they are currently hoping can step up because he almost won a Vuelta stage in 2021. So I think he can win a Grand Tour stage this year. So I'll give you a prediction that you can already guarantee this will happen. Andreas Lechnesson will have his peak career year. He will. Yeah. We've not spoken about him much. He will turn into a million euro a year rider like Aronsman. Be that through. He's a little bit more breakaway engine type but you get my message he'll win a couple of world tour races or top 10 gc at a world tour race a couple of them um if he improves his climbing a little bit everyone's like oh andreas selection very nice he's out of contract he'll leave 23 and another team yeah. will get him from 24 to 28 in that peak window that's uh, like that's you know, likely to happen him. pardon Unox needs to re-sign him. You know, another team that likes to sign Norwegians. Yeah, Visma. Visma. Yeah. But um, also next to that, I think a lot of teams will be intrigued by Leknison because he's not just that guy in Hill Classics. I think he also has that engine to be able to actually do a mountain train functionality in some shape. He's or so form. good. Now, <laughs> I really I'm like not him. sure about his... I'm not sure about his like long climb performances when he comes to mountain train, but is he? I might have an out there take. Is he? B Tech, Tobias Foss. Um, I've never really seen Foss sort of do what he did in Arctic Race. That was quite impressive yeah. from the breakaway. I know it was Arctic Race, but. Then the Swiss stage, yeah, it's similar. It's similar size, like they are, like 72 to 74 kilos, six foot plus, Norwegian. You're right. There is a lot of similarities. Like, again, you know, he came 11th in Paranese, but he lost three minutes 23 on Torini, finishing behind yeah. Ugo Ull. No offense to the man. He went to the France stage, but <laughs> Ugo Ull's not, no, but Ugo Ull's not a GC contender. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I think you've got to be very careful. There's a big risk with a rider like that, signing him to GC contender money when the watts per kilo just don't. Like that's just not his strength. I'd like him to lean into his strength, which is something a little bit different. I think he could be an insane stage race ruler for a high-level team, plus do some other things and with a TT setup, who knows, and maybe Ardennes as well. So... I really like Lechnesund, um, and it'll be tough for them to keep him uh, if other teams come with money, uh, I think. But yeah, any any other predictions for, for DSM Benji for the next year or next three years? or Yeah. I think I like your take when it comes to Lechnesund. I, um, I think I also think Brenner will make that step forward that we are looking for. When it comes to the rest of the team, I'm pretty high on Kasper van Uden. I think he's a, a real thing when it comes to that. I also, I don't know, like, Pavel Bittner is also such a curious case because he's a talented young sprinter, but... He'll get thrown into E3 and have no chance. That well. Yeah, but he also hasn't performed that well in 2022. So, was he even worth signing for their World Tour team yet? I'd say not yet, even though I'm super hyped on having another Czech rider in World Tour because they're very limited at the moment with Roman Kreuziger and so forth, having gone recently, well, not so recently, two or three years ago. But I don't know. There's just so many youngsters that need to stay, make a step up to be able to perform something. And right now, that's not the case yet. I'm also looking, hoping to see Wiedeberg making a, a step forward and so forth, just... Oh, Sean Flynn will top five envelope. Who? Sean Flynn. <laughs> Sean Flynn's quite a nice rider. I mean, like, again, yeah, but... like, all these all these young guys are lo- like quite a nice rider. Some of them aren't. Like, some of them aren't that good. And it's like, why are they on the team? 
But yeah, I, this not a dev team. This is World Tour. They're the heavy favorite to get relegated unless something changes uh, because they're not capitalizing when they do develop the guys to then have three or four or five riders really scoring 1,500 or 1,000 plus points. Yeah, because um, they leave. Because they leave, yeah. They maybe score 600, 700, and then you don't get two, three years of them really scoring the big points. So even if Bardet does do well, which he, I think he will do quite nicely, yeah. you know, maybe fifth at the tour or something, fifth at the tour, uh, sixth at flesh, third at flesh even, or good in, Am- in Amstel or Liège. I like Bardet, but... You can't even if he scores two thousand points. Someone else needs to score the points. So, yeah, and and they don't do the intermarche, the RK, or the Cofidis farming schedules either. So if that doesn't change next year, they're in trouble um, from a points perspective. And if you get into a hole, it's it's tough to come out, especially when you're trying to sign or re-sign guys, and you're looking like you're gonna be relegated, and now. Maybe some agents know that relegation exists. Perhaps that could influence contracts um, in the future. So, you know, it's unfortunate, but I think that's a really big concern and a problem for for this team. But maybe, maybe Pavel Bittner, Casper Van Uden, and Wellsford, like maybe they'll really smash like a dot pro semi classic schedule and it'll be fine. I don't know. Um, I'd like to see that. Yeah, that's DSM. Benji, do you reckon, do you reckon any management changes? Meh, I don't know. I don't think so. No. Down with the ship. <laughs> 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 Perhaps. All right, that's the DSM and Intermarche combined preview. Intermarche, if there's any, if you're a DSM fan, if there's any consolation, Intermarche show how quickly you can go from zero to hero in World Tour. A team we sort of derided maybe 18 months ago as not a very good team at all, bought the CCC license, well, skipping the queue. I derided. With, with the performance manager of Sunweb. No? What happened? Visbeek? Oh, was he at Sunweb? I think Ike Visbeek was at Sunweb back Jeez. in. Am I stupid? Can they buy him back? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you've turned my positive into a re- That makes it worse. That makes it so much worse. Um, <laughs> he exited well, in 2019. If you can find the guy who was on your team who turned into Marche completely around, <laughs> if we're getting him all the credit, then you can you can come back and it's all good. You know, three years is a long time. No need to worry. Like... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that can happen. It does. Well, to a, teams get good and bad really quickly. Um, you never know. It changes a lot. Um, I'm trying to be upbeat here. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. As always, we are waiting with bated breath, looking at clock tick tock, where this Cavendish announcement is. We will have the Klaxon Sound emergency podcast for that. Um, might even be uploaded before this if it's if it happens on Twitter from a starter if they get their act together if he goes there. Anyway, thanks for listening as always. Thanks to Zwift, and we'll see you in the next one. Ciao.